Good morning, and welcome to the first ever Bayer Facts Art Advisory Virtual Salon. We're particularly thrilled to see so many familiar names and faces who have joined us for our first ever in the Bayer Facts Art Advisory Virtual Salon series. Thank you so much for joining. Everyone at the Bayer Facts would like to take a moment to welcome our, our preferred providers. Thanks for joining today, Lion Tree, the Fine Art Group, Wovo, Danziger's, Danziger, Danziger and Morrow, Grossman Attorneys at Law, and VF Global Insurance. I'm Julie Baumgardner, the newly appointed Editor-in-Chief of the Bayer Facts, and a, fam a familiar name across art and lifestyle media. And it is my delight to introduce you to the newly banded Bayer Facts Art Advisory Group. The Bayer Facts Art Advisory is a first-of-its-kind membership program that offers direct, on-demand access to an elite roster of art specialists. Stick around after the discussion to hear Josh Bayer talk about and break down the advisory services and how you can be part. The advisory began as a mission-driven idea from Josh Bayer, the art advisor and probably one of the reasons why you're here today. And soon the group included Liz Sterling, a New York auction house veteran of 15 years specializing in American art, especially modernism, and now who has her own advisory, as well as Rick Wester, who has over 30 years of dealing and collecting, collection building with a specialization in photography, um, who's based in New York, and Cami Gahiga, who's based in London, who with her, art, with her Sotheby's experience now runs her own art advisory specializing in contemporary art of Europe and Africa, and Xiaoming Zhang, an art advisor based in Shanghai, known for being a key figure in bridging the art markets between China and the West. For more complete information about each of our advisors, please do head to our advisory website. So, without further ado, let's kick off the conversation with a question that's been circling many collectors and many industry folks and the art market watchers. In the US, whether it's wealth managers or financial reporters, word is that we're entering a bear market. Hey. Every market for me is a bear market. And please, <laughs> insert your bear joke here. And it's a bear market for me all the time. And sitting where we do in the art market, Liz Sterling, what do you think of these predictions? All noise or is there some truth to what we're hearing that art advisors and art collectors should be heeding? Of course. So look, obviously there are concerns about inflation and volatility in the stock market that we're seeing. The Ukraine-Russia issue, there's a lot of international things going on that I do think is creating a lot of noise and distraction right now and uncertainty for the future. That said, there was a tremendous amount of wealth generated during COVID. A number of people have bought second and third homes and also the expansion of digital access to the art world has tapped into a completely new marketplace and really expanded the audience at a variety of price levels. So I think you're seeing dual factors here. Um, what I would say is I think it is something to keep in mind. Um, I do think obviously there are certain sectors of the market, particularly emerging art, that we have been seeing considerable speculation in. And if you are looking to get into those areas, I would say buyer beware, really do your research and you should be buying things that you love rather than trying to buy things to flip. I mean, look, personally I buy things and there are certain artists that I am now placing strategically with private collectors so that I can free up the liquidity myself to take advantage of other opportunities. Because that's the other side. Whenever we're kind of seeing these frothy markets, there's also tremendous opportunity and artists that are being overlooked. So I think it's really important to look historically perhaps outside of contemporary art right now. I think they're great opportunities, impressions to modern, modern British, American, um, Latin American is a market where it's very uneven for obvious reasons. And I think that that's something that there are great opportunities in right now. Um, so again, it's just really important to be thoughtful. And the other thing with art also is a lot of collectors are now using it as an asset class. Um, so it's become a financial vehicle. Also, unlike stocks and other investments, it truly enriches your life and your environment. So there are intangible aspects of art. And my thought is, I think that the market will continue to be strong, but I do think that we may see some things cresting. Um, and if you're really a smart buyer, I do think that there are very good buys right now. So across the board, auction, galleries, and I think it is really nice with COVID kind of seeding that we are going back to a traditional fair schedule, auctions, people are starting to travel and see art again, and also interact with their peers and be having conversations that really have been very isolating for the past couple of years. So I do think that, again, if you're paying attention to all of that or speaking with someone who's plugged in, you can see good opportunities right now and smart places to be putting your money in the art world. Well, in a rising market, everybody's a genius and everybody can self-congratulate that they're a genius because it's always going up. And those of us who've been around have seen that their cycles and things go up and down. Um, I would say if you're listening to your wealth manager talk to you about 
buying art and how much to put in and what to do and their values, it'd be the same as calling me and asking me to pick stocks for you. Um, and um, I would stick to the experts. I think a, if we get into a bit of a bear market, I look at it as opportunity time, but it takes guts and most collectors don't have guts to be going it alone. Um, I see this year as a time to really get out of mediocre works you might have while there's still exceptional liquidity in the market to really cull things down um, and uh, cash out and then to really re-plug in your money to things you love. Um, personally, I've been for the last year or two steering people to Gerstein market, even though it's off by anywhere from 50 to 80 percent and you look feel kind of lonely because you don't see your exit. But if you have great art by great artists, this might be the year to try to, you know, to use a wealth manager if you rebalance your portfolio. So tough times give experts an edge. So part of me roots for that because then better advice is more valuable. Xiao Ming, who's coming in from China, thank you for joining this morning. What is, we're, so, we're particularly curious to hear about the outlook in the year of the tiger, which I know you just had your celebrations. Are there similar tales of economic woes circulating the Chinese art market at this moment? And how are you advising your clients? Yeah, thank you so much. And I want to first of all wish everyone a happy new year. And uh, uh, so we just uh, celebrated a Chinese New Year. Uh, the next will be the New Year for the Tibetan New Year that will be falling on the March the 3rd. So we will be having New Year's uh, through the spring uh, according to the different uh, tradition and the different countries. And I'm speaking to you from Shanghai. I'm in fact uh, working and being filmed in a studio right now, uh, looking at the camera. Sometimes I will be looking at the screen to, with my colleagues uh, from America. And looking at China, uh, China closed its doors since the COVID uh, in the spring of 2020. And uh, in the spring of 2020, we did not see auctions were taking place. China started to recover in the year of 20, uh, during the later part of the year of 2020. And we are seeing active art fairs, uh, Art 21 and also Westerbund started in the fall of 2020. And the 2021, according to China Art White, uh, White Book on the Chinese art market, uh, China is taking its leadership in the world stage as the leader in the marketplace and uh, taking the share of 30% uh, 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 succeeding America. America's share of the uh, uh, world market uh, uh, place is about 29%. On the overall sale in 2021, the overall sale was about 16.6 billion, and it is coming down from its highest point, which was 2011. And looking at the four activities last year, according to the various auction houses across uh, China, from Hong Kong to Shanghai uh, to Beijing, and uh, most auction houses had uh, celebrated its uh, historic, historically high results uh, in 2021. And uh, we are assuming based on these figures and the 2021 numbers uh, will be higher than the number I just uh, uh, mentioned, which was 2020 number, 17.6 billion US dollar sale. And, uh, but these numbers will come out in March uh, from the Art Basel report and also from the Artron uh, market research report. Uh, in China, we are seeing new generation uh, collectors are coming to the market to buy. They are not only buying Chinese art, but they are also buying Western art. And uh, art fairs are also very active from Beijing to Shanghai to Guangzhou, all the way to Shenzhen. Beijing, we have uh, Art Beijing uh, and also Beijing Contemporary. Uh, these two major fairs uh, attracted uh, exhibitors around the globe. 
Art 21 and also Western uh, West Bend Art Fairs took are taking place normally in the fall uh, during the year in November. Uh, these two fairs, especially Art 21, also expanded its presence to Beijing as well as its presence to Shenzhen. And despite the COVID-19 restrictions uh, on travel and international travel, China closed it, its doors and with the economy, the property market is coming down. So Chinese government is placing uh, the importance of culture, building the culture and the art industry in this country. Um, so looking at the south, we are seeing Shenzhen is a very active place. Shenzhen government is aiming to build 10 museums in the next few years. Uh, along the uh, facing along the harbors, uh, Qianhai area facing uh, facing Hong Kong. So Shenzhen is uh, taken to be the southern gate uh, for China, and we are also seeing new auction houses are coming to the market from Shenzhen's Funot uh, Fortis auction house to the new auction house uh, Kai Pai from Beijing. They are also actively uh, holding auctions in the second uh, tier uh, cities like Hangzhou. So the auction houses are very active and the competition is really fierce. So we are facing challenges is where we can find the great artworks. So we are seeing the fierce competition generated a high numbers for younger artist uh, sales, especially for the generations born in the 1970s and 80s and uh, all the way to the 90s. And also we are seeing the Western art uh, being introduced into the local auctions um, and uh, new auction houses are also seeking the ways to generate the sales such as uh, Poly Hong Kong and the Philips, they jointly hold auctions together to bring the international art and, uh, to this market. And it's been very successful in 2021 uh, with, their first, with their sale in June and almost 100% uh, items were sold. So Zaming, are you saying it's up, up, up for 2022? Are there political headwinds? or it's a bull market still? Uh, so the market is, uh, it's, a still a, it's a still a bull market. Yes, it's a booming market, which means we have a new blood. It's still growing. The market is still growing. And uh, so we have a new opportunities, innovations, and also uh, growth in this market. So even I've been living here since the end of 2020 and been really actively participating in these auctions and to really observing what is happening. And with the internal fierce competition, I think the auction houses, domestic auction houses, will need to develop new strategies to compete. Um, so one of the weakness in our country is the auction houses do not think international PR and marketing is important and they believe internal consumptions are enough to really help the, uh, the, the growth of the auction houses. When it's coming to a certain level, they will be seeking new strategies to grow and uh, especially with the opening of our country again after COVID, uh, we will see uh, new growth uh, that is unprecedented in our marketplace. That's a really interesting point, Zhao Ming. Thank you for sharing that there's so much activity in, in the market right now in China. And as we look forward to the art calendar for the rest of the year, we've actually been hearing some chatter that walls are full and pockets are tight. But Rick, I know you've had some really interesting thoughts about this and experiences lately. Would you care to share? Right, well, thanks, uh, Julie. Um, you know, the photography market isn't any one, there isn't any one photography market. It's uh, uh, traditionally been um, spread out over the history of the medium going back to the 19th century. Um, but I think for all practical purposes, 
to think about photography today, it, it's really bifurcated. Um, there's the so-called you know, vintage market, <coughs> um, which is uh, um, mostly uh, populated with modernist works. And then there's the postmodern market, which I you know, think of as contemporary uh, photography, basically from, well, I would include like the late 1960s up until the present day. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's changed radically over the last few years. I think one of the great things about what's happening in the photography market today is that it's opened up uh, tremendously to a broader audience. Um, uh, when I first got involved with it, you know, 40 some odd years ago, it was really a white market. It was, you know, uh, basically uh, um, white professionals, white middle class uh, uh, collectors um, and uh, institutions. It was the old, you know, sort of white boy network. And now it's really opened up the diversity, the move of diver towards diversity in the culture has affected the photography market tremendously. Um, and it's so, it's so um, exciting to see, uh, you know, populations that have been underrepresented in the art world in general kind of rise to the top. Um, uh, it, it just changes, you know, the very nature of, of what we have to pay attention to and uh, what's important. It's changing all of the aesthetics um, uh, of collecting. So um, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, who I think might be exciting to watch over the next couple of years, um, you know, I, there's so many good artists working in photography, uh, but I decided to focus on two uh, um, that are, uh, represent a pretty broad range. Um, one is uh, Alex Soth, uh, who's a photographer from Minneapolis, uh, who I know you know. Um, and, uh, oh, yeah, good, good. Well, we'll, you know, give out a, a sh shout out to, uh, to Alec here. Um, he currently, he, he currently has a show, um, at Sean Kelly Gallery, and I'll post the link to their website in the, um, uh, chat box, I guess, uh, in a second. Um, and Alec, uh, has been around for a while. He was born in 1969. Um, he first came to public prominence with an uh, essay, a, 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 a book of um, uh, photographs called Sleeping by the Mississippi, and um, uh, has since, you know, uh, uh, grown tremendously. Sean Kelly's been representing him for a while. Uh, my good friend Stephen Dater was showing his work, I think, for, for a bit, too. Um, and... Um, uh, the other photographer that I was going to mention is a uh, really interesting fellow that I got to know about um, when I was back in the old days before COVID doing a lot of benefit auctions. And uh, his name is Mikhail Okuna. And uh, Mikhail is uh, uh, a queer uh, Nigerian Swedish photographer um, uh, living in Pittsburgh. And his work uh, relies mostly on uh, African folk tales and uh, um, traditional stories to uh, create the narrative behind his pictures. And I'll, uh, he's represented by Clamp Art in New York, and I'll, I'll post that uh, uh, link in the chat box also. Um, you know, in terms of where the market is going, uh, the photography market had always been sort of a generational uh, market. And a lot of the original collectors and dealers and um, um, followers are aging out. And so the vintage market, I think, has uh, dwindled quite a bit in terms of numbers, but not in terms of value. I mean, really good vintage works are going to continue to be uh, highly sought after. But, but Rick, all that they care about are the masterpieces, right? The rest of it, looking through the bins, it's really a masterpiece-only market. Uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, it it has dwindled down to that, Josh. That uh, um, you know, even uh, sort of the um, uh, the descent of APAD, which is uh, you know, kind of uh, APAD, uh, the Association of International Photography Art Dealers, um, has not because of COVID been able to uh, 
uh, host a, an art fair the last two years. Uh, they are planning on one this spring, though, which is great. Um, but the membership has dwindled, and the ability to pull off fairs has, has dwindled. Um, but APAD and then Parry Photo are basically the two biggest art fairs. And even Parry Photo has had trouble uh, recently because of the um, uh, COVID situation also. Um, but that's, you know, I, I would say like uh, in terms of what to collect, you know, the, the movement in the culture towards diversity has really positively affected the photography market in many ways. There's so many more choices of, of artists to look at and to learn about. Um, and I think that that's, that trend is going, definitely going to continue. That's really cool to hear, Rick. Diversification across the board is actually a really positive development we're seeing in 2022, and I'm excited to see how that unfolds further. But I want to switch gears just a little, Cami, um, to bring to to circle back to something that Liz brought up, which is the the Russia Ukraine conflict. Um, we've been I know that you're on the ground, very much on the inside in Europe, and you were you mentioned to us earlier that. You had some insight into that. Would you mind filling us in how that might affect art collecting, especially in Europe for 2022? Yes, absolutely. I mean, overall, it's true that we have seen some uh, geopolitical uncertainties arrive, especially with Russia and Ukraine. But what we've seen with uh, most geographical art markets is that they've experienced an actual positive turn over the last years during the pandemic, in particular for the contemporary African art market. What's quite unique with this market is that it is not reliant on a, on a single economy, really, because it has such an international collecting base. Um, I was speaking to the head of uh, Modern and Contemporary African Art Department at Sotheby's, who, who mentioned to me that roughly 30% of bidders uh, at Sotheby's are Africans, another 30% North Americans, another 30% uh, Europeans, and then the remaining 10% from Asia. And this is mostly for specialized sales. Um, and an interesting fact that you don't necessarily see so much highlighted in the media is that actually 60 to 70 percent of successful lots, um, the ones that fetch the highest prices in specialized sales, are actually bought by collectors who are from and live in Africa. Um, it's true that in cost of the sales and post-war and contemporary sales, like whether, whether Philips, uh, uh, Sotheby's or Christie's, you've seen uh, some skyrocketing prices in the last two years for African artists. I'm sure. I mean. Yorna, Marco Boafo, Tisquame, Abutia, Jade Fano Jutimi. I mean, the, the sales for young contemporary African artists, that means under 45 years old, have surged by over 120%, and uh, we keep seeing the, the average prices on the rise. But one, one thing that is important to take uh, notice of is that what's been happening is that there's a, a real reckoning by artists of African artists and, and black artists that it is great to see um, you know, the talent of African artists being recognized at auction and uh, being acclaimed, but really for, they didn't realize that for the market to sustain itself beyond a, a particular, <laughs> particular moment of, of trend or attention is that you need continuous support and cultivation of this growing market. And so what's been, what's been fascinating to see is that you see um, several artists who've experienced a tremendous success uh, at auction sales going back to Africa, uh, many artists um, such as uh, Kane Hinde Wiley uh, setting up an artist uh, residency in Dakar. Over the last few years, you have uh, Amarco Boafo who's set up a studio complex in Ghana and Accra. You have Michael Armitage in Kenya who has uh, recently opened the Nairobi Contemporary Art Institute. And then you have, uh, I mean, there are so many different names that I could give, and that's just over the last few years, because, I mean, just in general, not just the contemporary African art market, but what you find is that the primary metric to measure uh, the sustainability of an artist's market is truly the acceptance of institutions, the number of exhibitions that an artist is being um, shown at, and, um, I mean, across Europe and internationally, you have seen a rise of exhibition of uh, artists of African descent or black artists of minorities being showcased. So this is an acute understanding that artists, uh, creators, and art professionals who are involved in this space know that you need to develop uh, uh, centers within the continent, um, educational ones, training ones, in order for the market to be interesting and to, to keep being, um, to keep uh, having uh, that attention and for the market of these artists to grow. 
Um, so that's that's something to take into account. And so and this uh, portion of um, uh, collectors that I mentioned earlier at auctions that are buying African artists for large sums. I think this is only going to grow with uh, the rise of institutions and academies and schools and centers that we're seeing on the continent, which is not necessarily always highlighted and perhaps um, is important to, I mean, absolutely important to note. So you're saying there's, while there's speculative fever, there's also real organic growth simultaneously and they get confused by the media sometimes and it would be different if it was only one and not the not both i mean i do understand the, the confusion as well because you have so first you have specialized sales of african art sales that um, actually houses like strass and co in south africa organized or art house in nigeria uh Sotheby's in uh london bonhams and then you also have these crossover sales that we've seen with young contemporary uh, artists of the last years with phillips uh, Sotheby's and Christie's and uh, with young contemporary artists that are being uh, shown and sold uh, alongside uh, other international artists and it's true that these artists have particularly seen a rise in, in prices, a tremendous and very quick rise uh, which is fueled um, by, it's true by emerging, uh, by collectors of the emerging markets uh, there is a speculative side but as I mentioned there is this realization that uh, many art patrons and artists um, took note of and are hence setting up um, you know systems in place and foundations in place in order for the market to sustain itself beyond just a moment of trend and so I mean for any markets in general you have to be careful when you I mean you have to be cautious you have to do your due diligence when you want to collect art um, at any price at, at a certain price point you have to, to start thinking about it but there's also the need to realize that there are um, actual systems that are being put in place in order for the market to keep growing and I um, mean the, the number of high net worth individuals uh, in Africa is just is, is, is growing by 2025 it's set to grow by 25 percent according to a, a market report the latest web market report by um, art Tactic, which is an art market research firm in uh, London, and they cover a lot of emerging markets, in particular Africa. And you really see that there's a, I mean, there is a positive trend, obviously, in terms of the prices that we're seeing at auctions. It's exciting, but also the clear realization that there are um, that there are important systems that are being put in place for that market to sustain itself and, and thrive. Great, that's so interesting to hear. And Liz, I'm curious, how is that impacting and affecting how you're advising clients this year? What's your outlook? Um, I mean, I think one thing that I'm really stressing is you're gonna get the best opportunities and the best choice of material if you are really casting a wide net. So to be looking at galleries, dealers, and auctions equally. Um, and also because we're at the beginning of the year to kind of pace and be thoughtful, not really blow the whole budget in the first six months. Um, I also think, again, as I said before, just to be wary of trends and to see through the hype and really be buying what you appreciate for the artists and their work. Um, also, I know my former colleagues at auction houses are not going to love this, but do not get carried away bidding an auction. Um, we see that happen a lot. So that's the other thing is just kind of have a strategy and stick to it. Um, also, I think art world etiquette is something important, particularly for people who are buying on the primary market. Um, Look, often to flip something for short-term game, I absolutely understand that temptation, but you really, the art world is an ecosystem, and if you're going to have the most success building a collection and as a collector, you really need to prioritize the importance of your long-term relationships. And if you do want to be selling things because you have seen a huge appreciation of value, there are certain unspoken code and rules that you should go through. So I think navigating that is incredibly important, particularly with the digital world and with the proliferation of images and just the way that information travels now. Um, also, I think something that's key is fast payment can often open up opportunities. I think more and more um, I'm seeing opportunities for people who want to get money out of art to invest in something else right now because of the volatility. So if you can pay someone within 48 hours, you might be able to get something for a 10 or 15 percent discount and that opportunity will not exist, um, you know, a week later. And then finally, buy what you love and get good advice. I guess on that note, on good advice, Josh, I want to punt it back to you. Who are the artists that you think are good investments this year? What are you telling your clients who to look at and who to invest in? Well, my traditional answer is that's what people pay me for is to give those answers. So as you join our art advisory, we'll get more clarity on that. 
I would say, in general, I'm not very um, commercially minded, so I'm always looking at history and figure that the uh, good advice will come out of that. So um, I can't tell you exactly, buy this, it'll double next year. Um, I tease my hedge fund guys who call for free advice and they don't want to pay and uh, they want guarantees that I want the same thing from my stocks. Um, I say focus on an artist you love, figure out which one you would really like to own them, you know, if your dream could come true, then do all your homework to find out all the available works of that artist and see if you can do that. So it's not, I don't work on a sort of shopping mode of one thing a week or scattershot, let's try 20 and hope the one hit. So I don't really answer your question directly, which artists. Um, I only love, you know, 20 or 30 in the world. So I'm not adding a new one every other day. Um, some advisors do that. I think our team generally is not that way. So we're a little bit similar. So um, I don't know, that's a sort of, you know, I don't think anybody's hearing me say, go buy, put $50 million in NFTs either yet. You're not the right person, I think, to talk about that. But Cami is. Cami, I know you've been in some really interesting discussions about NFTs and what that looks like for 2022. Do you want to fill us in on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I would like to say as, as a general basis, just like Josh said or Liz, that you have to make informed decisions and to get into the space with caution. As I mean, the market is still quite recent. There's not a lot of historical data and there's lots of nuance. Um, so yes, at a certain price point, you should uh, make sure that you know what you're getting into. Um, there's one thing uh, for the year ahead that I would say is that there's definitely going to be growing enforcement in the crypto space in relation to regulations and tax compliance. Uh, a useful tool for, uh, especially for American collectors who are interested in getting into the space, is that uh, the U.S. Department of Justice actually released uh, a framework um, that really uh, outlines the do's and don'ts and the risk areas of the NFT space. So that's that would be a good thing to to take a note at uh, before getting into it. I mean, as most of you know, uh, I mean, an NFT is a unit of data that sits on on the blockchain and says that you basically own uh, the image. And it really started as a way to legitimize digital art that was not really considered as an, as other art forms. Um, one interesting aspect that has uh, really helped in legitimizing NFTs is that Sotheby's and Christie's have opened their own NFT departments. Um, and uh, it's, 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 it's quite interesting what you mentioned before, because a lot of people, it's true, have sort of trouble understanding the appeal of NFTs. They think it's just they look like cartoons and most of them are absolutely awful when you, look, when you think about uh, the aesthetic side of things. But we need to acknowledge that the, fa the fact that taste change with generations. Uh, when you think about the Beeple sale and that 30, there were 33 beaters, 58% uh, were millennials. That already gives you an idea of that space as well and how things could, uh, could advance and, and grow. Um, and yeah, so it's, a, I mean, when you, so the, the collectors would come to me and, and ask me, well, um, I want to get into that space. I think it's exciting. Everyone's talking about it. There's obviously a lot of friends around it that people just want to go hand, hand, and, 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 and just buy one. Um, and there's, there are like two interesting developments that I usually talk about is that the, so the, the blue chip artists that I would call it are in the NFT space where you you probably heard about the crypto punks and the apes are realizing quite significant sales and have been highlighted that uh, um, auctions, um, you know, they, they range between, I think, 200,000 to 400,000 and they are more and more uh, considered as a potential, you know, fan, they're more and more used as a, as a financial instruments and there's even potential for, for learning uh, systems with, uh, with the, these particular works. And then you have another exciting development is the rise of DAOs, which are decentralized autonomous uh, organizations. It can um, either be a group of collectors that decide to come together and um, 
try to raise, uh, to, to organize a fundraising in order to buy a specific NFT. And you have artist collectives as well that come together and uh, try to raise funds by the sale of their artworks in order to fund uh, future exhibitions, uh, future programs, uh, publications. There's one in particular in Africa that is quite interesting and they're actually showing at Art Dubai uh, next month and they've shown at uh, Art Basel Miami with Tezos um, in December. It's a Cyberbat Collective and it was founded by uh, Senegalese artist who's very young, she's in her 20s, she used to work at Google and she understood the appeal of uh, NFTs, especially for African artists uh, in terms of the resale royalties but as a way to come together a community with uh, a common goal and um, and they have really exciting projects. What's her name? Uh, Linda Dunya. Linda Dunya and she started the Cyberbat, um, Cyberbat uh, NFT Collective, yes. And Xiao Ming, I want to ask you, what artists are you looking at in 2022, both Western artists in Asia and also Asian artists that what the West takes interest in as well? Uh, so the artists to look at, um, I was thinking through the question and I think I would not uh, pick up the artist from my own personal taste, but rather I would uh, be looking at uh, um, one category, say the Chinese artist, how we can look at the Chinese artist. Uh, in China, we have uh, two, uh, the, the artist, uh, uh, we have two groups of uh, artists. One belong to the official system. They work for the central government. They work for the local government. They work in the art schools. They also artists, and uh, so they will be commissioned by the government to produce art. And also, we have uh, um, independent artists who are really uh, working uh, with galleries or without galleries in China. We have a lot of the artists, and uh, so the market is only covering less than 1% of the artists. So what I hear, I want to list up the names that uh, uh, had uh, achieved the great records last year in 2021 are the generations uh, from the 1970s. They were born in the 1970s and 80s. And here are the artists I want to list here. Uh, first is uh, Huang Yuxing, uh, the artist who is represented, recently represented by Armin Reich Gallery. Uh, the second one uh, player in the marketplace is uh, Jia Ai Li, and uh, he is represented by Gagosian. And uh, recently, Chao Space, uh, Chao Zhibing, had a show for uh, Jia Ai Li uh, during the, the art fair season. Uh, last November. Uh, the third artist is Hao Liao, also represented by Gagosian. Fourth artist is Chen Fei, uh, represented by Para Tang. And the fifth artist is Chou Xiaofei, represented by Pace. And also Liu Wei by Li Men Maopeng Gallery, Wang Guangle by Pace Gallery, and uh, Zhao Zhao by one of the top Chinese contemporary gallery is Tang Contemporary Art. And uh, when mentioning Tang Contemporary Art, one of the phenomena I want to mention here is uh, Chinese government uh, put a lot of money into the culture and arts industry. They are also putting the money uh, into investing in the local art galleries. So Tang Gallery has been very actively producing shows for blue chip Chinese artists. So it is a gallery for us to follow. And following Zhao Zhao, we also have a Qin Qi uh, represented by the Tang Contemporary, and also Song Kun by Para Tang. So among these lists, we are seeing the top young Chinese artists. They are already being snapped away by uh, the major uh, Western uh, contemporary uh, galleries and it's important for us to also discover great talents who have not been represented. So where to find these great talents? In China we have a Biennale's, great Biennale's, Chengdu Biennale opened last November and also in 2020 Jinan Biennale and this year uh, in Guangzhou, we will have the Guangzhou Triennale. So through these Biennales, Triennales, we can find also great artists, emerging talents coming these 
uh, biennales. And also important for the collectors to be aware of uh, the representations coming from the local galleries from Beijing to Shanghai to Chengdu, which is uh, in the Sichuan province, and to Hangzhou and Guangzhou and Shenzhen. These are active cities uh, who have great galleries. So it is always important for us to do the homework. And the market is an indication of what's being established. And it's hard for the people and the audience and the collectors from overseas to know what exactly going on in our market. So I think uh, we are here to really help you to translate the knowledge and also help you to work with you to really build the knowledge uh, in this market uh, from China and also to other countries in Asia. That was so interesting, Xiaoming. Thanks for that. I think now let's kick, let's shift gears and go to the, the questions that have been submitted by our audience. And I think a great place to start actually is what transformations are we expecting this year in the art market? One thing that we are going to continue to see is the influence of crypto on the market. Um, Going back to what Cami was saying, I just more and more people are comfortable using that. And what we saw, obviously, with the Giacometti at Sotheby's this past November, but also with auction houses starting to allow crypto to be paid for Banksy um, and other artists, I think more and more you are going to be seeing crypto being used as a currency in the art world, which I do think further broadens the market. Rick. The trend that I mentioned earlier about uh, increased diversity and um, uh, one thing I didn't mention was the internationalism, the growth of photography uh, across borders is really going to start informing collectors in a much greater way. Here in the States, it's happening mostly in nonprofit um, uh, um, spaces and organizations uh, where uh, you know, uh, people are reaching out across borders to, to bring work that their audience has, has never seen before. I'm really interested to hear what Cami has to say about this, though, because uh, uh, she and I have been uh, discussing uh, a few photographers, and, uh, including uh, Mikhail. So, uh, Cami, what, what do you have to say about that? Yes, I've definitely, um, I've definitely noticed that, especially with um, American galleries, I think there's a lot of attention on uh, African-American photographers. Um, recently, especially for Carrie May Muse, who's an African-American photographer at Jake, Jack Chamin Gallery, um, I've definitely noticed like, a surge of interest for, for her work in, in particular. Um, this is definitely one that I'm really excited about is the 150 for Contemporary African Art Fair, which uh, will happen in April this year in Paris at Christie's. It's been really interesting is to see these uh, cross collaboration, these collaborations between auction houses and, and art fairs and these new hybrid models that we really emerged during the pandemic. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a fair that showcases um, a right range of uh, galleries from different uh, countries in Africa and uh, in Europe and America as well with a, with a strong focus on contemporary African art and contemporary African photography as well and uh, painting. So that's uh, it's quite exciting. And great, Kemi, I'll see you in Paris. And I think now is a great time to actually to kick it to Josh so he can explain a little bit more about the art advisory and how you, the audience, can be part of it. But before he, before he takes over, I just want to thank everybody for coming today and participating and for the fantastic questions that we were submitted. And uh, we look forward to hosting you once again for another one of our virtual salon series. So stay tuned for those details as they emerge. Thanks so much, everybody. Hopefully this webinar showed that in the idea of this sort of membership on demand advisory, it's not an algorithm. It's not a tech company. It's specific people with access and knowledge. And the things we do at the Bear Facts involve access and knowledge, and now expanding past my own levels of that to people from different parts of the world, different life experiences, different expertises, to make it interesting to, I mean, the goal of this was for the five panelists to find it interesting. We think if we interest each other, that you as a collector, an advisor, a dealer, um, will find it interesting as well. Obviously, 
we want feedback. Um, but as you become a member, which, and we're pretty transparent, it's a $3,000 fee for the year. It gets you access on demand to all five of us. Um, it's not for us to walk you around every art fair for eight hours a day. It's there when you have a real question, like, what do you think of this particular work? Or, I saw this on Artnet, I was gonna buy it. Or you're in London, I heard this show is great, that we can give you feedback. It's also there if you want us to help you make a transaction, find us uh, this, find us a Kahandi Wiley. We'll do that. There's a straightforward fee of five to 10%. Um, I think ideally, and f some of the people signing up, we have highly experienced, knowledgeable collectors who say, this is pennies. I can talk to Rick about, you know, Kurtesh. I can talk to Liz about George O'Keefe. I can find new ideas from China, from Zhao Ming. I want to do emerging art. That's a no brainer for like somebody spending, you know, you know, six, seven, eight figures a year on art. But it's also a valuable service for people who just started who are like, I don't want to do something stupid. What am I doing? Is this one even good? Oh, that's not even a unique work. Or, oh, you saw that, the auction, it was damaged. So we're trying to give that in a way that's efficient to everybody's time, the collector's time, and to the advisor's time. And uh, as we grow, we hope this grows. Uh, we hope some of you look through our website a little bit more, contact any of us to try to see more particularly about joining. Thank you.